Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Freemasonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. I'm your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Well, kind of a short episode this week due to the traveling I did last week. I traveled four and a half hours south to spend the day with a good friend of mine, and then I took him two and a half hours east to the Valley of Danville to hear a lecture by Brother Chris Hodap, the author of Freemasons for Dummies. My friend is not a Freemason, but This event was open to non-Masons. I figured it would be a good thing to expose him to. He informed me that his uncle had been a Mason at some point. So, when we got to the Valley of Danville, we were walking around and he pointed to a picture and said, Hey, that's my uncle. To which I replied, Yeah? And he was also the Grand Master of the State of Illinois in 1999. So, it was kind of funny to see his face when we discovered that. I met with Todd Creason, Greg Knott, James Fry, and Mike Shirley of the Midnight Freemasons, and we all had a good laugh, and it was really great just to hang out with those guys and have some dinner and have good conversation. I was a little bummed out that Judy, Scott, and Steve couldn't make it, but maybe next time. I did record the lecture from Brother Hodap, and I will have that up in episode 101, is what I'm planning on. One of the other things I recorded, which will be in this episode, is Brother James Fry, who had a little speech over dinner about St. John's Day. So I will be featuring that right here on the show in this episode. Next week, I'm hoping for our 100th episode, we will be able to have Brother Todd Creason on the show. Then, like I said, after that, we'll do Brother Chris Hodap. After I got home and had three and a half hours of sleep, I drove to Detroit, and then to Flint, both in Michigan, with a few of my good friends and brothers. Nothing brings you closer than traveling 12 hours round trip with someone in a car. We had a great time. We visited the Detroit Masonic Temple, the same one which made news as of late because of their tax situation and how Mr. Jack White of the White Stripes saved the temple by paying its back taxes. On a side note, Jack White has no interest in joining, He has told the Detroit Masonic Temple that he is in fact a devout Catholic and there is still too much gray area in there for him. Anyway, a fantastic tour and we got to see a few really cool areas. If you ever get the chance to go out to Detroit, Michigan, I recommend you try to figure out a way to get a tour. It is absolutely amazing. There are over 1,000 rooms. Anyway, I posted several of the pictures up through our Instagram account, which pushes out to Facebook, Tumblr, and Twitter as well. So check those out if you like. After the Detroit Temple, we made our way to Flint, Michigan for a festive board where my friend and brother and road trip partner, Charles Harper, was a guest speaker. He did a fantastic job presenting for that event. I videoed the event and I recorded the audio. It requires some cleaning up since we were eating dinner over the lecture and there's a lot of dinnerware clanking and such, but... You can look forward to that in the next few weeks as well. Quickly, before we get into James E. Fry's piece, I just wanted to say that if you want to support the show, check out On It Labs through our site. Use coupon code WCY for 10% off. You can check out Stitcher Smart Radio and use promo code Whence Came You with no spaces. And check out the Android and Apple apps for streaming access to the show and bonus features. And if apps aren't your thing, then check out uh, our website. We have a donation button on the site, which is all run through PayPal and is completely secure. Without any further delay, here is Brother James E. Fry, founder of the Rebus Research Society on St. John's Day. Brethren, family members and friends, I would like to thank you for coming out to support us um, and our goal to rebuild the Valley Library. Um, I would like to make a special thanks to illustrious brother Christopher Hodet for coming out and lecturing for us this evening. But the one thing I do want to focus on is the true reason why we are here. Um, And that's not for Masonic education, though it is admirable. It's not for fellowship, though fellowship is fantastic. We gather here today to celebrate St. John the Baptist Day um, in observance of St. John the Baptist Day, which will be tomorrow, uh, June 24th. One of the most commonly celebrated holidays of the Masonic calendar is St. John the Baptist Day. It's celebrated June 24th, and it falls on what we know as Midsummer's Day, um, which is known as the summer solstice, right? And it's often marked by festivals, fertility rituals, celebrations. The summer solstice occurs when the planets tilt of the semi-axis, inclining the southern hemisphere 23 degrees. Um, And that basically tilts the planet more towards the sun, so we get more sunlight. This happens twice a year at which time the sun reaches its highest position, the Psi, 
as seen from either the North or the South Poles. This day, tomorrow, is the day of the longest sunlight. And to understand the importance of this holiday, it's important that we trace its origins back to primitive man. Something astonishing happened about 40,000 years ago. Homo sapiens arose out of the primate families, and there is one very distinct difference between Homo erectus and Neanderthal, and that was the ability to think abstractly. In ancient times, man's survival was depending on hunting and gathering, right? And it was dependent on nature. So, in ancient times, the wind blew, man knew to find shelter. The nomadic peoples engaged in, you know, these daily activities, but when they began to think abstractly, they began to see the mysteries in nature. These new abstract thoughts began to arise. Instead of understanding that the wind blows, seek shelter, they began to understand and began to ponder, why is the wind blowing? What is the sun? What is the stars? So men began to ponder their own perception of reality, as opposed to just the instincts related to the elements. Primitive people tried to explain these mysteries in terms of their day-to-day -day lives, right? And this allowed them to perceive the rising and the setting sun as the greatest manifestation of nature. Its presence during the day warmed them and comforted them at night, provided their crops with energy to grow. They kept away wild beasts. And the sun made their daily lives possible and is acting as a guardian over them. And so the first man engaged in sun worship. Um, which was natural for men barely struggling to understand and recognize the basic understandings of the world. Um, as different cultures arose, elaborate mythologies were created to teach the meanings of the stars and the planets. Right? The central question to understanding the sun is not its daily journey from east to west, but its yearly journey from south to north. And this began, um, the summer solstice became a festival of harvest and a celebration of the new year. In the same respect, the winter solstice was significant of the end of the slow decline of the sun, the symbolic death that arose new life. In the same respect, the Greeks celebrated the story of Ceres and search for her daughter Persephone as a metaphor for fertility and growth in the illusion mysteries. The Egyptians held the allegory of Isis, Osiris, and Horus in the same regard to celebrate the birth, death, and resurrection of the sun. In the Roman Empire, especially among the soldiers, the rite of Mithras explained the solar mystery. But as time progressed, Rome became predominantly Christian. The old Roman feasts and festival days were turned from pagan festivals to Christian holidays. And these were often dedicated to Christ or the saints. So even today, you can see in Western culture, we retain our solar customs, though the origin of which mostly has been lost to us. So. As time progressed, the uh, days that were once devoted to Apollo and Dionysus were now devoted to the Saints John. Um, it was common in the Middle Ages for the workmen's guilds to place themselves under the protection of a, of a certain saint. And these would often represent their trades, right? So the fishermen, they would adopt St. Peter, right? The builders would adopt St. Thomas. Um, but masons, primarily in Scotland, adopted the patron saints of John. Um, and this was uh, recorded as early as 1450. And this is what we can now say is the beginning of what is known as St. John Masonry. Brother Joseph Fort Newton writes, there is no historical evidence that either of the two saints of the church were ever members of the craft, but they were adopted as its patron saints. After a manner of former times, a good manner is too, that they have remained so in the Christian lands. Lodges that were once dedicated to them instead of St. John, or instead of King Solomon as formerly. So, St. John the Baptist was held and is held as a major religious figure for the Gospels, for the Quran, the Bahi faith, Mandalism. Um, it is believed that St. John was strongly influenced by the Essenes, who were apocalyptic sect, who performed baptism and would often speak out publicly against the Roman Empire. John is prophesied about in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, which states, Behold! I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. John is known as the first one who recognizes Jesus as the Messiah, and he then baptizes him in the river Jordan. 
John humbly requests to be baptized by Christ, who in turn convinces John to bestow the favor upon him. Jesus refers to John in the book of John, uh, chapter 3, verse 35, as a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. So, as uh, the New Testament teaches us, John dies a martyr. He publicly denounces King Herod's marriage to his niece, Herodias, which is incest in his view and is in violation of Old Testament law. Um, so Herodias convinces her daughter, Herod's grandniece, to dance before Herod and to seduce him if he bring John the Baptist's head to her on a golden plate. So Herod has John arrested and placed in a dungeon and gives him a chance to denounce his former teachings, to embrace the Roman Empire, and to claim Herod's rule as legitimate in the eyes of his followers. John refuses three times and eventually is beheaded, and his head is served on a golden plate to Herodias. Josephus writes of a different reasoning in uh, the 18th book of his Jewish Antiquities, chapter 5. He states that John was a good man and commanded the Jews to exercise virtue, both as a righteousness towards one another and uh, piety towards God. So to come to baptism, for that the washing would be acceptable to him, if they made use of it not in order of putting away some of their sins, but also for the purification of the body, supposing still that the soul was thoroughly purified beforehand by righteousness. Now when others come, came into the crowds about him, they were, very, they were greatly moved by hearing his words. Herod, who feared least the great influence of John had over the people, might put into his power and inclination and raise a rebellion. This gives us a view of John as a, somewhat of a revolutionary figure, speaking out against Herod's right to rule as in, and the legitimacy of the Roman Empire. And this was common, especially among Jerusalem. You have the, the zealots, right? It, it was uh, John's death that Josephus, at least, believes that Herod's army was destroyed in the, result, in the revolts. So the real question is uh, how we as Masons are supposed to view St. John and view this holiday. Um, as speculative Masons, we can see a clear similarity between St. John the Baptist and Hiram Abiff. Both men are celebrated in the fraternity as martyrs and men of integrity, and they died to preserve their honor. The Grand Lodge of England adopted the holidays as landmarks for the craft in 1717. As Freemasons, we should hold these holidays to preserve a connection with the earliest men of antiquity. This is a direct relation to the earliest abstract thoughts to understand God and, and his relation to the world. As time passed, Man's perception of the world changed, and so did these sacred days. To adopt the tenets of man's progress, and also to preserve the earliest understandings of light and life. There's a certain verse that I think sums up St. John and his teachings, and it is found in uh, Luke chapter 1, it's verse 79, which is to give light to those who, are, who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Thank you very much, brother. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. He did a great job. I'll soon like to put up some links when he actually sets it up to a fundraising effort that he's having to help the Valley of Danville's library, which is what this festive board he did was actually funding. And I'll keep you all posted on the status for that. Continuing on a little expose of the Midnight Freemasons that we were doing, uh, this week I'd like to focus on its newest member, Brother Brian Shimeon. Brother Brian Shimeon is a life member of AO Fay Lodge number 676 in Highland Park, Illinois, and the Medina Shriners, Lake County Shrine Club. He was the past master counselor of D. Malay Lakes Chapter in 1995. Brian is a husband and a father of two. Brother Brian is also the lead contributor to the Brothers in Arms blog, which is a pro-Second Amendment blog page. And, uh... He has a great quote, which is start square and finish level. Brian is a real stand-up guy. He calls it like it is, and I can't say enough good about the guy. It's, uh, it's kind of weird. I just want to describe him as an American patriot and Freemason. But uh, if you spent 10 minutes with Brian, and I'll tell you, you'd feel like you'd had known him for years. He has a few pieces up on the Midnight Freemason site, and he'll have even more coming soon. So check those out. Next is this week's famous Freemason, and it's one of my favorites, Manly Palmer Hall, or Manly P. Hall. 
Uh, he was born March 18, 1901, and he passed away relatively recently in August of 1990. was a Canadian-born Freemason. Manly P. Hall is the author of over 150 books, the best known of which are Initiates of the Flame, The Story of Healing, The Divine Art, Aliens, Magic, and Sorcery, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, and An Encyclopedic Outline of Masonic hermetic, and Kabbalistic Rosicrucian symbolical philosophy. He was also the author of A Masonic Curiosity of the Lost Keys of Freemasonry in 1923, more than 30 years before he joined a lodge. The preface of later edition states, At the time I wrote this slender volume, I had just passed my 21st birthday, and my only contact with Freemasonry was through a few books commonly available to the public. Later in 1944, he wrote The Secret Destiny of America, which popularized the myth of a Masonic purpose for the founding of the United States of America. In 1950, he weighed in again on the meaning of Freemasonry with his booklet, Masonic Orders of Fraternity. He was initiated June 28, 1954, passed to the degree of fellowcraft September 20, 1954, and raised to the sublime degree on November 22, 1954, Jewel Lodge number 374. Now, as a side note, there are several videos of Manly P. Hall delivering lectures on YouTube. Uh, they're very popular. I suggest that you guys check them out if you have any interest at all. And they're not short. They are at least an hour to an hour and a half in most cases. That's it for this week. Remember to find us on Facebook, follow on Twitter at Whence Came You, and remember we're everywhere that is social. Please check out our Masonic business pages, including our newest PB&J Water for water filtration needs. I know Brother Jeff Koch, who is the owner there, and he's a great guy, always on the level. And you can shop his site for parts. Everything is made in the United States. And if you use promo code WCY and check out in the notes, you'll help us out as well. Don't forget about the Midnight Freemasons page, publishing three new articles a week, over 200 a year, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. A special shout out to Rob Lewis at the Far From Centered podcast, and another podcast by our brother, Brother Juan Sepulveda, host of the Winding Stairs podcast. And I also want to remind you guys to check out the freemasonnetwork.org. It's a social media site just for Masons. It's kind of a one-stop shop for blogs and media connecting with other brothers. It's a great site, and I hope you guys all check it out. You do have to join the site, which can take a bit, because they do check out your Masonic ties and make sure you're affiliated before letting you join. It's funded by the House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., so like I said before, it's legit. I have the Whence Came You blog on there, as well as the Midnight Freemasons. Both are mirrored for easy access. Anyway, I'll talk to you guys all next week. Stay on the level, and for Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson.